1944, Italy. Seven months after surrendering to the Allies, Italian airfields resounded with growing American air might. From rebuilt Axis bases, the Allies were able to attack Nazi targets beyond the working range of bombers based in England. Out of the many sky battles, Allied air forces had gradually achieved air superiority. Now, theater air commanders, Generals Spots and Aker, arrived at Foggia to plan new strategy with General Nathan Twining the 15th Air Force CG. Spots and Acre were handing Twining the biggest job his bombers had ever undertaken. The 15th Air Force soon got the news. They had been ordered to fly through Hitler's back door and destroy his oil industry. General Twining and his staff took on the job. General, you've just received a new directive establishing target priority for the bomber offensive of the 15th Air Force. The decision has been announced. We will destroy oil refineries and synthetic oil plants. Now, Colonel Young, what does our intelligence show us in regard to these targets within our area? More than 50% of the refineries and synthetic plants producing gasoline for the Axis are within range of the 15th Air Force. Between 25 and 30% of the total Axis production of gasoline is represented by the 10 large refineries around Floeste. While these refineries were seriously damaged in the attack last August by the task force operating from Egypt, recent photo reconnaissance reveals that, with one exception, all refineries are currently operating at full capacity. General Hubert Todd, it's a big job we've got ahead. He knocked out a Palestinian means German will be supplied of one third of his oil resources. Bomber boys who moved up from Africa started the Ploesti air siege. On the morning of April 5th, 94, B-17 swung into formation. Close by were 136 B-24s. We were strong. We expected the enemy's coastal radar network in Albania and Yugoslavia to spot us as we made our approach over the Adriatic Sea. Although it was still early in our 600-mile run to target, we got into flak suits. They're a kind of insurance. Climbing to altitude, we skimmed the Yugoslav mountains. Mighty peaceful. Peaceful until they bristled with flak guns. We were soon to find out the hard way that Ploesti had become the third best defended spot on the continent. a high altitude mission, 21 to 24,000 feet. As we neared the target, we edged into tighter formations. Each had top cover. We all remembered a 1943 Ploesti mission with 177 liberators in which we lost 54 planes. Would this be like last year's mission? This one might be worse. 250 enemy fighters, outnumbering ours, three to one, attack. Fighters almost had enough. 
By the time we crossed the Sofia Belgrade line, our lightnings moved in for the knockout punch. Then we ran into flak. 256 heavy guns fill the sky with black, deadly mushrooms. smoke pots effectively covered Ploesti. Accurate visual bombing was impossible. At headquarters, they knew something had to be done. After many missions, the target was still effectively protected. On 10 June, operations decided on a new tactic. We're going to dive bomb from our uh, tomorrow using P-38. miles, we buzzed the Balkans. The smoke screen had to be lit. We climbed the bombing altitude and some of us dumped our wing tanks as we got close to the enemy. After hitting the refineries, we attacked German fighter units on the ground. Our P-38s got through the smoke. The mission was successful. We had destroyed 29 enemy planes and had damaged three refineries. But the job wasn't done. Operations increased. Servicing went around the clock. The plan called for the bombers to be on target during the morning hours and stop Ploesti's working day. Now they prepared for 600 plane missions. They tried new electronic devices for blind bombing. Everyone hoped the sheer concentrated weight of tonnage would crack German and Romanian defenses. Ploesti sort of got under everyone's skin. After hitting it from the air, the flyers rehashed it on the ground. The men ate it, slept it, cursed it especially the flak and smoke. The four-month campaign since April had cost 1,900 men, the crews of 189 bombers and 41 fighters. Early in August, General Twining called a meeting of our group commanders. I've called you in today to discuss future air operations against Western oil refineries. This strategic air force, during the next three days, will attack continuously, night and day, with maximum effort against all primaries in the area. We got over Ploesti, all right, but the enemy gave us a warm welcome. They rammed up more than 45,000 rounds of flak. That didn't stop us. During three days of smoky air siege, we lost 30 more planes, 23 to flak. But now we had over 100 Mustangs as escorts. The enemy jabbed and our 51 swooped into the battle. Hit hard, enemy fighter strength fell apart. Displaying courage far beyond the call of duty, our boys drove the enemy into the ground. kept our bomber crews on their toes. We waded through it all the way to the target. 
the full weight of our attack fell on Poesti. That did it. The steady pounding whittled away 90% of Romanian oil production. The global and greedy designs of an Axis dictator were consumed in a blazing, oily ploeste. This was the crowning climax to our air siege. In only five months, this had become the graveyard for one-third of Hitler's oil. Oil, a pre-war weak point in the Nazi military supply system, became a bottleneck under repeated Allied blows. The bombs had crushed gasoline producing, storage and shipping centers. Mainly, Germany's 350,000 slave workers tried to repair the damage. But now, all the refineries in the rich Ploesti cluster were damaged or knocked out. We hurt them, but they hurt us too. The Ploesti campaign had cost us 270 heavy bombers, 49 fighters and their crews. Each plane and each man helped to shorten the war. As we hit the donut line, we were still flying the mission, and we wondered about our missing air crews. How many would come back? The answer came sooner than we had expected. Twelve days after the last bombing of Ploesti, we got a real thrill. An airlift of 56 transport-converted B-17s were bringing back our buddies who had been forced down. Romania had surrendered to the Russians. In just three days, more than 1,100 returned as part of Operation Reunion. This was the first mass prisoners of war liberation. Of the 600, only 10 were stretcher cases. All in all, considering what they'd been through, they were a light-hearted bunch. It was good to be back. Yes, it was a day to remember, that day at Poggio Airport. These were the first. And General Twining made it plain how glad he was to have his men back. He had planned something special. From his Coral Sea experience, he remembered what privation meant. First, he gave his men medical care and food. Then, Godspeed on their next mission. Their new checkpoint was the Statue of Liberty. Their target was home. The 15th Air Force, by burning Ploesti off the target list, did more than merely destroy enemy oil production. They brought eventual disaster at compounded interest. The German war machine was stalled for lack of fuel. Later chapters will show Allied air power accurately blasting the vitals of the Axis with the hard-won bombing experience of the United States Air Force. <laughs> carried the war against a maze of targets in a shrinking Nazi Europe. 
Day after day, with growing might and effectiveness, these forts and lips and fighters wore down German industry and organization. The story of air power over Europe has been told in countless tales of courage and skill. But victory had its price, for the Nazi was determined to exact a heavy toll from our airborne ranks. We made every effort to reduce this toll. Most of our aircraft returned to home base safely. Some, less fortunate, limped home torn by a flak and enemy fighters, their wounds mute tribute to the American craftsmanship that built them. Others, not so lucky, fell prey to Nazi flak and fighters over enemy territory. But our story concerns those who nearly made it back. Those straggling, crippled bombers and fighters who were forced down at sea and what was done to save them. This fort, Tiger A. Abel, is in trouble. The pilot gives the emergency signal. The crew prepares to ditch as the burning plane nears the treacherous water. But the sea doesn't claim this crew, for a rescue launch miraculously appears, takes the crew aboard, and sets course for England. How is it done? This room is the focal point of air-sea rescue. From here, all actual rescue work is controlled. Hours before takeoff time, while bomber and fighter crews are being briefed on today's mission, this officer is plotting from the field order the timings and overwater routes the aircraft must take on their way to and from the target areas. From these routes and timings, individual patrols for rescue launches, spotter and amphibious aircraft are determined. Here, the officer is shown pinpointing the positions of these units of air-sea rescue. While this information is being plotted, the air-sea rescue liaison sergeant alerts the Royal Navy and passes essential data from the field order. He advises the number of boats required for the mission, the area the boats are to cover, and the time they are to be on patrol. The Royal Navy alerts the necessary motor launches and in turn calls the RAF high-speed launch bases and assigns them patrol areas. Now the Royal Navy and RAF boats put out to sea and head for their assigned positions to start their long, cold watch. Next, operations at the Emergency Rescue Squadron is alerted. Here are based the air-sea rescue aircraft that do the actual spotting and rescuing of the airmen who have been forced down at sea. Having received the necessary data for today's mission, operations alerts the pilots and crews of the rescue aircraft. These specially equipped thunderbolts are called spotter aircraft. They work in pairs and are on patrol at pre-designated points before the first mission aircraft leave the English coast. They carry droppable dinghies and smoke floats. They also provide fighter cover for the slower and more vulnerable rescue aircraft and launches. When they jettison their rescue equipment, they're a match for any hostile craft who might venture into the area. The Catalinas have patrol areas along the overwater routes the mission aircraft take. They are used for quick rescues when conditions at sea allow for a water landing. As the Thunderbolts leave the ground, flying control at the field immediately notifies air-sea rescue control that the planes are airborne. The airborne times are then posted on a special status board. The same procedure is followed with the Catalinas. As they take off, control at air-sea rescue is notified in the same manner and the airborne time is again posted. head toward their pre-arranged patrol points and on arriving there, control is called and time in position is reported. This too is posted on the status board. Now with the high-speed launches of the RAF and the motor launches of the Royal Navy in position, and the Thunderbolts and Catalinas of Air-Sea Rescue in position, the stage is set for a distress call. So let's return to our burning fort, Tiger A. Abel, and see just how an actual rescue operates. Mayday, mayday!
Mayday, Mayday. Tiger A. Abel. Uh, Roger A. Abel, Air Sea Rescue here. What is your trouble? Hey, Abel here. On fire. Going to ditch. Understand. Transmit for a fix. Over. Tiger A. Abel going down. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Simultaneously with Air Sea Rescue Control, fixer stations situated along the English coast have received bearings on Tiger A. Abel. This is one bearing, the second bearing, another bearing. Once determined, the three or more bearings on Tiger A. Abel are immediately called through by hot telephone lines to a room near Air Sea Rescue Control. Here, men working over a circular map plot the bearings on Tiger A. Abel. This is done by drawing a string from the fixer station's position on the circular map along the bearing telephoned them by the fixer station. This process is known as triangulation. Where three or more strings cross, that is the plane's position. This fix is now recorded and called into the air-sea rescue control room where it is plotted for the controller. We now know Tiger A. Abel's last position. Meanwhile, the bomber has ditched and the crew has set out a smoke float. Teamwork 7-0 from Colgate, come in please. Roger, Colgate, 7-0 here, standing by. Colgate to 7-0, stand by, I will give you the ditching position. Teamwork 7-0, steer 120 for 45 miles. Roger, steering 120, out. So Teamwork 7-0 drops down over the water and sets course for the crew of Tiger A. Abel. Constant contact is maintained between Teamwork 7-0 and the Air Sea Rescue Controller. Eyes are alert for a sign of the dinghy. Speck on the water. There they are. And the rescue proceeds. of determining his position and of his subsequent rescue are well underway a few seconds after his last message, I'm bailing out. The strings cross. Here is our fighter. The position is phoned through to control. Even before the pilot hits the water, his location is known. Colgate to Teamwork 3-1. Over. Teamwork 3-1 to Colgate. Over initial point of 5,000 feet. Uh, Roger, steer 110, 30 miles. Fighter pilot bailed out. Seagull 29 is 4 miles southeast of Mayday position. 
Roger, Colgate. We'll steer at one, one, zero, 30 miles. Seagull 2-9 from Teamwork. Over. Seagull 2-9 here. Seagull 2-9, man in water, four miles northeast. Over. Roger. We'll nip over and have a look. So Seagull 2-9 does nip over to have a look. In the meantime, the fighter pilot. So the search starts. Keen eyes sweep the vast areas of the North Sea where a man in winter may survive no longer than 20 minutes. Speed is essential. Here again, constant contact is kept with air sea rescue control. What's that? Hello, Colgate. Teamwork 3-1 here. I think I have sighted the dinghy. I'm going down to take a look. The pilot is in his dinghy and looks okay. The boat is in sight. Good work, Teamwork 3-1. And so the Thunderbolt orbits the dinghy, keeping it always in sight, until Seagull 2-9 can get there to make the actual rescue. Sharp. There are times when it is impracticable for a Catalina to land. Sometimes the sea is too rough or the dinghy too close to the enemy coast. When these factors are present, the droppable lifeboat is used. And our AF Warwick drops his boat. An American fortress drops his. Both types have been used successfully in the North Sea. These boats have a gasoline engine and sails as well. There is food, dry clothing, a radio, extra gasoline, medical supplies, and other useful equipment on board. Once aboard, the crew can get underway quickly and pull away from the hostile coast to a point out of range of the enemy guns to rendezvous with a rescue launch that has been diverted by control to pick them up and bring them home. Oftentimes, a plane, though badly shot up, can make it to home base under its own power. In this case, Air Sea Rescue Control will furnish Thunderbolt Escort to see the big friend either safely home or to be on hand in case further trouble develops. Hello, Air Sea Rescue. Boxcar H. Howe here. One engine out. Don't know if I can make it. Can you help me? Roger, Boxcar H. Howe. Transmit for a fix. Over. Okay, Air Sea Rescue. H. Howe here. I'm at 12,000 feet on three engines. Indicated airspeed, 120. Transmitting for a fix, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Over to you, Air Sea Rescue. Uh, Roger, Thunderbolts will meet you. In these cases, fixes are obtained on both the plane in trouble and the Thunderbolt. Control then directs the course of the two planes until they are in visible contact. Thus. H. Howe from Teamwork. Coming in on you now from 6 o'clock. Same level. Over. Roger, little friend. Boy, am I glad to see you. And so, this Liberator limps home with the knowledge and satisfaction of having these air-sea rescue aircraft flying alongside him in case of any further difficulty.
we have seen here is typical of many days in the war against the enemy. The Air Sea Rescue Controller must often carry on several rescue operations simultaneously. These four methods of aid and assistance are ever ready and new aids are being developed. Thus, in this alert, quick-thinking control staff is realized a new motto that holds true wherever Americans fly and fight. Airmen are not expendable needlessly. England. On the first anniversary of their operations against Fortress Europe, the 8th Bomber Command prepared 376 B-17s for the two most critical targets on their list, the ball-bearing plants at Schweinfurt and the Messerschmitt Aircraft Factory at Regensburg, both deep in Germany. What an anniversary. Just a year ago, we flew that first mission to Rouen. 12 B-17s flying 56 miles to target. Now we were taking 376 fortresses 500 miles into Germany. Never had we prepared for so rough a mission. In 1943, the AAF was still growing up. The Luftwaffe had already reached its peak. But our boys taking their battle folders knew it. By the time we turned in our personal stuff, it was well understood that the projected doubleheader would bring on a large-scale and costly air battle. In chapels all over England, most of the men turned to their ministers, rabbis, or priests. Getting into the trucks, we didn't dream that August 17th was being written into air history. Not only because of us, there were other soldiers in the skies. This was the same day that Sicily fell to the Allies. The same day that the RAF bombed Pinamunda, the V-2 rocket plant. The same day that General Kenny's B-25s destroyed 200 Jap planes at Wewak in eight minutes. On this day, our double mission involved the deepest penetration ever attempted into Germany and the largest bomber force to be dispatched to date. We knew that as we went further into Germany, we'd hurt her more. But we also knew we'd have to pay a higher price for admission. And now the last briefing as the pilots recheck the details of the mission with their crews. Individuals no longer existed. We were now 10-man teams, and on our teamwork would depend our success and perhaps our lives. Action against Schweinfurt got underway. The Regensburg task forces had just hit their target. A vast and intricate machine of destruction had been set in motion. Behind these modern warriors were weeks of high command planning. Now, crewmen took care of routine duties. Ahead of us were four hours of rugged action. Our guns were going to be especially important today. 
At the briefing, they told us we'd have help from short-range fighters and eight their support mediums. The fighters were supposed to take us about halfway. The mediums were to bomb diversionary targets. But for the worst part of the trip, we'd be on our own. Finally, after a few hours delay due to bad weather, 2,300 men counted the seconds. American bombers had never been stopped. Although German defenses had stiffened, American formations had not been prevented from reaching their objectives once they responded to the green takeoff signal. As always, each thundering run was an epic of suspense until 30 tons of bombs, plane, and men were lifted from the earth. The leader of the first wing, Colonel William Gross, swept in a huge circle around the field. Gradually, the second and third bombers edged into position. The sky quickly filled with stately fortresses sliding through space. But as soon as they got into formation over the British fields, they were picked up by German radar. Across the channel, the tentacles of the enemy's locator system, having touched the flying fortresses, now pinpointed them in space. Luftwaffe experts accurately plotted the American course, altitude, and speed, and promptly informed their fighter control. Immediately, at dozens of Nazi airdromes from as far north as Denmark to down around Paris, German fighter units began to send up everything they had. Their order was, intercept and destroy the oncoming fortresses. The answer to the increasing Allied bomber offensive was this stepped-up German fighter strength. Waves of opposition screamed off the map of Europe. In spite of the Luftwaffe, Allied planners selected our targets according to Allied Air Force priorities. That's why, merely three hours after the fourth bomb wing had paralyzed the Nazis' Messerschmitt factory at Regensburg, we and the first bomb wing were on our way to strike Schweinfurt in the face of an aroused enemy. As we began to run into flak, our gunners could feel the entire German Air Force warming up. Flying in enemy territory, we felt like goldfish in a bowl, waiting for the attack. Strict radio silence was maintained while trained eyes searched the sky. unleashed every trick. The B-17 suffered the most savage blows since the war began. Although Jerry knocked 20 bombers out of the sky on the road to Schweinfurt, we never broke formation.
despite the ferocity of the attack, which extended all the way to and from the target, we pressed forward. Our guns kept burning the enemy out of the sky. Approaching the bomb run began the most critical defensive period. Now we divided into smaller groups. Sacrificing our mutual defensive firepower to bomb the target most efficiently. The crucial moment. The moment around which the entire mission revolved was now in the steady hands of our bombardiers. Each bomber was now committed. No more evasive action until bombs away. At this time, the formations were most vulnerable to attack. It didn't matter. We had a job to do on Schweinfurt. We had 400 tons of high explosives to deliver. Getting 80 hits on the two main ball bearing plants, we could defend ourselves again. At least to the extent of evasive action against flak and fighter attack. But the main idea now is to get home fast. At the British landing fields, word on the sky battle was out. Red flares were expected. That meant wounded aboard. These planes had priority at landing. Many of the fortresses themselves were crippled. A few came in with feathered props or with knocked out landing gear. After struggling home at housetop altitude, one B-17 with wounded aboard was committed to a crash landing. The name of the ship was My Prayer. The anniversary battles lost us more men and aircraft in a single day than the 8th Bomber Command had lost in our first six months of operations over Europe. We who carried the war 500 miles to the enemy's industrial heart knew better than anyone how expensive it was. We had lost 60 bombers and their crews. What happened this 17th day of August, year 1943, was a testament to American men with modern weapons and a very old idea, fighting for freedom. On this day, high altitude bombers engaged in their greatest and, from the point of view of loss, their most disastrous air battle to date. Nonetheless, the results justified the price we paid. Out of these trials by fire, there did emerge from the struggle one of the most polished and powerful instruments of warfare ever assembled. This force of men and planes, this accumulation of skill and experience, became the power and might of the United States Air Force.